Amen. 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 Lord God, we give you all the glory and the honor and the praise. You know, for some people, it's a sacrifice to come out of the Sabbath school, to get on up, get out, and get here on time. How many of the Lord honors that sacrifice? How many of you can tell the true heart and soul of the church by those that come to Sabbath school? Amen. Amen. Are you, are you here this morning? Mm -hmm. Amen. All right. Are you, I mean, but are you here? I see you yes. here, but are you here on yes. this morning? Yes. 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 Amen. Amen. We're going to go into the lesson study. Um, this quarter we're studying the book of Numbers. The book of Numbers. And I know um, many years ago I used to get put off by the book of Numbers. And I stayed away from it because I thought the book was just full of numbers. And this one begat that one and there was 10,000 in this tribe and then you had 35 over here and just numbers and numbers. But actually that's a misunderstanding of what the book is about. How many know that when you go to the Bible and you prayerfully approach the Bible, you'll see one person reflected back at you in that Bible. Uh -huh. And that person is the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. John said, sorry, the Gospel of John says in 539, search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. Amen. So I don't know about you, but whenever I go Amen. to the Word of God, I'm looking for one person. Yeah. I'm looking for Jesus. Amen. And Jesus in the book of Hebrews, lo, I come in the volume of the book. He's here. From Genesis to Malachi, it yeah. testifies and witnesses about one person, Jesus Christ. So we want to see Jesus get exalted on this morning. So if, if you are, are, are worried about the book of Numbers having nothing much for you this lesson, if you appreciated the last lesson, which was on the first, second, and third epistle of John Moore, I say just use it as an opportunity to really get to challenge yourself and to challenge the Holy Spirit to reveal Jesus Christ in His Word. Because you know what happens when Christ gets revealed in His Word? We get revealed in our hearts. Amen. We get to That's see who we really are. Amen. We get to see where we really are. So when we come into the book of Numbers, and the lesson is called A New Order. order yeah. A New Order. Now the lesson focuses primarily on a natural order and how God did things decently and in order. Our God is a systematic God. Our God is not a God of chaos or a God of confusion, but a God of order. Things that he runs in this universe are run by order. Atheists can say that there is no God, but they cannot deny that something has put this universe in order. And we all know that someone is not a something, but a person, and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, through whom all the worlds were created, and nothing was made that was made that he didn't make it. Right. So looking here in the book of Numbers on the first day of the lesson, talking about a new order, I want you to understand here that these things were written, that's the key scripture, it's 1 Corinthians 10, 11. These things were written for an example to us. It's written for us to look at it and say, you know what? That's me. Wait, 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 wait. You know when I see Moses grumbling, wait a minute, that's me. When I see that Miriam and Aaron had to hold up his arms because he wasn't going to make it, wait a minute, that's me. You see, when we look at the scriptures, we should see ourselves in where we are. And what God has done in the scriptures, especially in the book of Numbers, let me tell you, the original title for the book of Numbers is actually called The Wilderness. It's really called in Hebrew, The Wilderness. If you open a Jewish Bible, you'll see the word The Wilderness there. We have the word Numbers because it's the Greek title that we're going by, Numbers. But The Wilderness gives you an idea of what you can expect. Because those that study the Bible, how many Bible students we have in here that study their Bible? Those that study the Bible understand that when the wilderness happens, there's always a time of testing, trial, and failure. How many know that in our Christian lives we're going to go through the wilderness? How many know that even right now in our Christian walk and growth, we're going through a wilderness? The promised land is when Jesus Christ comes back, but for now we're going through a wilderness. So what we see in the book here, in the book of Numbers, to understand Numbers, you need to understand the book of Exodus that came before it. You know what I'm saying here? Because in Exodus, you have a great leaving, a great emancipation of the children of Israel who were in bondage. And as you understand the Bible, you understand that Egypt is a, is a, is a type of the world. It's a type and a symbol. 
Before we knew Christ, we were in the world. And the world was a very natural thing. But like Israel, we were a slave to it. We were in bondage. We might have thought we were free. We might have thought we had benefits. But when we came to the deliverer, who was Jesus Christ, in the Old Testament it was Moses, we realized that there was more in store for us. That God had more for us than the world could offer. So we followed this spiritual Moses, who was Jesus Christ, and we followed him out of the world. When we give our heart and lives to Jesus Christ, we have left the world and are now following after Christ. Now, it would be wonderful if we could go from the world to heaven. But that's not how the Bible works. From the world to a life of perfection, a life of glory. But that's not how it really works. We're going to go through a wilderness stage. The success, and amen, the success and the key of your wilderness journey is all depending upon are you willing to follow your leader. Yeah. Our leader is Jesus Christ, so are you willing to follow? So the new order that we're approaching in the lesson today is nothing but following after a new way of life. Amen. I mean, if, you, if you truly are a Christian, if you've truly been born again, your life should be different than it was. Right. Right. If the life that you lived in the past and the life that you lived presently are the same kind of life, I mean, that something is wrong. Yeah. There is something wrong, not with the Savior, but something wrong with ourselves. Yeah. And sometimes, just like the children of Israel, we want to hold on to Egyptian baggage. Yeah. You know, we don't want to let go fully of the things that, that God says let go of. And you're going to see that all throughout the book of Numbers, that they're coming into different situations, and they're wanting to go back to the old world methods instead of using the new spiritual methods that God has employed for them. Turn the page to, to, to the next page, page six. Organizing the army. I want you to understand this about Israel and this about ourselves. Israel was not prepared or designed to fight anybody. They had been slaves for 400 years. Now the Egyptians weren't foolish. They weren't given slave swords. They weren't given the military training. They weren't giving them combat experience. So when they were delivered from Egypt, it was a miracle that only God had to do it. God said, okay, now you're in the promised land. Now, sorry, now you're, sorry, in the wilderness. And a journey that could have taken only three weeks ended up taking 40 years. You see, it's all how in tune you are with God, with your commander, with how successful of a soldier you'll be. It's only how you are in line with your brothers and sisters in Christ. You see, the main problem, though, is when Christians fight among each other. Oh, yes. You know, can you imagine soldiers going over to Iraq and then having the weapons join the enemy and then start shooting at each other? So why does that happen in so many churches? And we wonder why sometimes the blessings don't come like they should. You see, sometimes the devil will get us tricked in the wilderness to believing that our own brother and sister in Christ is our enemy. Yes. And you see, you know, the Bible says we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities. So a lot of times there are things that will happen in our brother or sister's lives and they'll take it out on us. Mm. And we'll get offended. But instead of getting offended, I've got a better solution. Forgive them. Yes. Amen. Love them. Amen. You know what? Forgiveness. I'm going to love you anyway. Yes. Amen. I've heard you said this about me, but I'm going to love you anyway. Yes. I saw when you did this to me, but I'm going to love you anyway. Amen. I saw when you gave that look and that smack to my child, but I'm going to forgive you anyway. You see, we have a mission and a purpose, right. and the commander wants us to reconcile so that we can be an effective army, yes. so that we can be effectively together. How many know that we are only as strong as the links that bind us together? Amen. For example, the word of God calls us sheep. We're called sheep so many times. And you know, being called a sheep is not a compliment for any animal. I'd rather be called something that can attack. You know, call me a lion or a tiger or a bear. You know, we're God's bear squad or something. But no, we're sheep. A sheep has no claws, a sheep has no teeth, a sheep has no way of defending itself. So when a wolf comes, a sheep will die every time. Jesus gave a, a, a parable of this. He says that a good shepherd, when he's lost one sheep, he'll leave the 99 and go after the one. Let me tell you why. Because 99 sheep are safe when they're together. You're only as safe and strong as you are together. Yes. Here's what I mean. God has given the sheep extra muscles on the leg and extra fat on the leg. And when the wolf comes near to a pack of sheep, the sheep will come together and put their necks together because their necks are where they are vulnerable. And so as long as the wolf keeps biting at 
have a leg and the sheep keep their neck protected, they're okay. But one sheep by itself has nothing to protect its neck but a shepherd. Do you see that? Yes. So as long as we are together, we are protected. You are my keeper. I am your keeper. We are all part of this army that God is raising up to do exploits in the world. How many want to do exploits for Jesus? Somebody say, Jesus, I don't want to die before I have done exploits for you. Exploits for you. So then when we look at this, so God systematically organizes the children of Israel and he puts them in order. You know what? Look at the church today. God has a purpose and function for each member in the body. Right. There's no such thing as a spectator Christian. Mm. Somebody says, well, I just go to church and I just, you know, see what's going on. I clap, I pay my tithe, and I go home. Uh -huh. You know what? God says, you know what? I've got more in store for you. Right. There is a purpose for you. Yeah. I didn't create you to be a spectator. I created you to be a participator. I created you to be a benefit to the body. Yeah. I gave you something right. inside of you that no other person can give. That's why I brought you to this church, or brought you to this church, or brought you to that church, Amen. so you can be a blessing. Amen. So then you have here, also the text talks about how Israel was now going to fight a battle against the Amorites. And let's give you some background that the Amorites were back in the days of Abraham. And God told Abraham, your descendants, 400 years from now, are going to rise up and conquer the Amorites because of their sin is rising up, but it's not to its full portion. Now, I want you to understand this. Before we go and judging the Amorites and say, you know what, God, that, 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 that's a great thing. because it, it was a good thing because God is always right. We have to understand, though, if not for the grace of God, we could be Amorites. If not for the grace of God, we would have rejected what Christ had to offer us in salvation. But we thank God that we have the common sense. We thank God that God had the grace and the mercy to look down upon us so that we can be in the Lord's arms. Yes. So what we have here in the Amorites is the Amorites ended up, you know, being a casualty of the army of Israel. And it really shouldn't have happened in the natural realm. These were slaves that had no skills. These were these were people that had no weapons training, no fighting skills, but they had one thing that they could not deny. God was on their side. Amen. How many of them, God is on your side every battle and every obstacle you'll face, there's Amen. victory at the Amen. end of it. You may be fighting, you may be fainting, you may be falling, but if you keep on enduring, if you keep on holding on, if you keep on standing your ground, God will make the way every time. Amen. Monday, the presence of the Lord. Now, the presence of the Lord is a very important thing in our Christian growth and development. Yeah. Why? Because if we practice the presence of God, we will end up emulating God. Right. You know, I found for a long time it was really hard to have Christ-like qualities when I really wasn't studying my Bible. Mm. It was really hard to, to have a Christian attitude when I, you know, the only time I was around Christians was when I was in church. Mm. You know, we have got to get to a point where God is our constant yeah. companion. Yeah. Seven yes. days a week. Yes. He's not a God that says, well, you know what, it's Tuesday. You got about four more days to do what you want. And then, you know, come on and, and worship me on the Sabbath. God says, you need to worship me now. Yes. You need to invite me yes. into your life yes. now. Yes. That problem that you have would be so much easier if you got me involved in. Yes. The situation, that the decision that you've got would be so much easier to decide if you included me and asked me what are my thoughts on it. So God has a, a purpose for his presence. It's the book of 2 Corinthians. It says that when we see Jesus, we are transformed by that same image of glory, from glory to glory. What it's saying is not seeing Jesus, you know, with the physical eye. It's saying when you spend time with the Lord in prayer, yes. when you spend time with the Lord in the Word, I guarantee you, your life will change. Yes. Some of the habits... Some of the strongholds, some of the things we cannot break in life will be broken if we just practice the presence of God. Amen. Do you follow me with that? Does anybody know what I'm talking about here? Am I talking theory or does anybody know the reality of what I'm speaking right now? The practicing the presence of God is not an option if you want to be a successful Christian. Practicing the presence of God is essential if you are going to be an effective Christian in the kingdom of God. God wants us to be in his presence. And that's what he taught Israel. 
They had this thing called the tabernacle. And when they had constructed the tabernacle, it sounds kind of, you know, boring when you're going through Exodus. And they got some skin of a badger, and then they got some gold and some sticks, and they put it together, and they fashioned it. And, you know, it sounds just, you know, you're reading the Bible saying, okay, Lord, where's the end? You know, praying your Bible has a picture in it so you can see what it's talking about. But, like again, going back to the same essential premise of the Old Testament and the Scriptures. Jesus says, if you look in there, you'll find me. Search the Scriptures. In them you think you have what? But they, and they what? Testify of me. So when you look at the tabernacle that was created, everything from the wood represents the cross of Calvary. Everything from the color of the crimson represents the sin. And you begin to see a framework and a tapestry of the life and the ministry of Jesus Christ. The Israelites just had this thing they were carrying. They didn't understand that it was a deeper meaning to it. But when Jesus Christ came, he said, hey, I am the way, yes. the truth, yes. and the yes. life. Now, they understood that to be the tabernacle. They understood that to be the thing. It, it, it was, it, part of it was called the way the truth was the um, Ten Commandments and the, the law of God on the inside. And the light was the springing blood of Aaron's rose coming out. So they understood the way, the truth, and the life to be the very presence of God in their midst. And when Jesus came, he said, oh, here I am. Amen. Here I am. That, that tabernacle you have, you've been waiting for, here I am. Here's the presence of God. Let me tell you something. When Israel followed God and they waited for his leading, they were undefeatable. They were unstoppable. When they obeyed God with all their hearts, nothing could stop Israel. Is the same thing true for us today? Absolutely. When we are in tune with God, when we have that relationship with Jesus Christ, when we are immersed in the presence of God, we are unstoppable. How do you know that when you get deep into a relationship with Jesus Christ, the devil doesn't like it? Yes, 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 yes. Let me go one more, one more. But how many know that when you get deep into a relationship with Jesus Christ, even some of your brothers and sisters in Christ will not like it? Mm. That's true, brother. Watch yourself. Good spiritual. So we pray. So we pray. Tuesday, under the standards. Now I want you to understand this. This is very important. It says it, 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 it's a standard. A standard is not just something. These things here are standards. You know that? All these little signs here, these are standards. These are standards. We think standards are just some kind of rules or a guideline or, a, or something to compare to. But a standard wasn't that. A standard that people know, know where you stand. At Seventh day Adventist, we have a standard in the Sabbath. So when people look at us, they know where we stand. Now, the children of Israel had standards that differentiated each tribe from each other. And let me tell you that. In each of our lives as Christians, God is raising up a standard. I want you to understand this now. There's a text in the Bible. It says that when the enemy attacks you like a flood, the Lord will raise up a what? A standard against him. You see, God says to the devil, you can only go this far before you have crossed over the line. You see, there's a certain territory where my standard is raised. If the devil crosses this line, he's got to contend with God. See, but as long as my standard is up, as long as I'm holding up that blood-stained banner, as long as people understand that I'm a Christian, and that Jesus Christ is all to me. The devil can only go so far in his attacks. He knows why he's got fiery darts. He has to stand back and foam at you. Because if he gets too close, God's going to get him. So you know what? That's why it's so important in our Christian growth in this wilderness, it's time to stop hiding your faith. It's time to stop pretending that you're not a believer. It's time to stop pretending that you fit in with the world. People on your job, in your school, should not be amazed when you tell them that you are a follower and believer of Jesus Christ. It should be natural to them. In fact, when you come into a situation or a room, the atmosphere should change. If people were telling dirty jokes, they should shut their mouths when you walk in because they know there's something different about you. That standard needs to be raised. It needs to be that wherever you go, there's a flavor of godliness. The Bible says in Matthew 5 that we are salt and light. Those are distinguishing characteristics that cannot be hidden. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. If you are on your job or in your school, the light of Jesus Christ should such and shine. If you are in a situation, the saltiness of the flavor of Christ should be wherever you go. A 
standard needs to be raised in our lives. How many say, Lord, Lord, raise a standard in me today? Amen. A standard of the cross. And that's what we want. We want people to understand just where we stand, just who we are, and more importantly, whose we are. Yeah. We belong. We were, how many of us are bought with the price? Yeah. How many of us we do not own ourselves? Yeah. You know, I, I have found that, that, that in the wilderness, the devil will trick us to think, you know what? Well, you know, God gave you one day, and so we, the rest are all yours. He just wants one day. How many of us all days belong to God? Yeah. It's all God's. Yeah. We come together on the Sabbath to worship and praise and do together what we cannot do at home by ourselves. Right. You understand that? We are all a body. And when two or three come together who have that standard raised, when two or three come together who are giving their life to Jesus Christ, Jesus is in the midst. Amen. 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 So the world should know our standard, Amen. the things that we have raised up. Wednesday, a call to ministry. A call to ministry. When the Israelites were being divided up into sections around the camp of Israel, they put three tribes to the north, Three tribes to the south, three tribes to the east, and three tribes to the west, except for one tribe. One tribe was left out called Levi. Now, I was studying my Bible, and I realized that when the children of Israel came out of Egypt, there's supposed to only be 12 tribes, right? Yes. But if you've got three in four different corners, that's 12, and then Levi makes 13. So I always wonder about where that extra tribe come from. And then I went back and I studied the word of God and I remember that Jacob had a son named Joseph. Joseph had no tribe. But his two sons had a tribe. Manasseh and Ephraim. But Levi had a very special duty, a very special thing. Levi was to minister to the tabernacle of God. And the children of Aaron were to minister to the, um, uh, to the mercy seat of God. To the very presence before God. They were the priests. Now, how does that translate into understanding of something today? I want you to understand that every Christian has a Levi ministry in their life. You know, you may be a, 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 an usher in church, but in your home, you need to be a Levi. No, you don't catch that. You don't catch that. Let me go back one more time. Levites were the priests and the ministers. They were standing before the presence of the Lord. They were taking care of the things of God. They were ministering to the other tribes. Let me go back one more time. So in church, you might be a carpet cleaner. But at home, you are a Levite. Some of you are getting it. What I am talking about is that if we think that ministry does not begin with our own family, look at the word of God. Ministry belongs in the family so much that among all these relatives, God took one family member and gave them the ministry of ministering to others. Uh, God has called each and every one of us to minister to our families. You know, we wonder why so many times, why our, our friends and our, our, our neighbors, when they come to our house, they notice there's something different about our homes. They know that they can't just bring any old DVD into our house. They know they just can't bring any old kind of thing into our house, any old kind of food into our house. Because if we truly are dedicated believers, our house is marked as holy ground. It's a place where our children get trained in the fear and admonition of the Lord. It's the place where husbands and wives encourage each other to grow and hold on to the Lord. It's a house and a place of ministry. Now there's a place for ministry out in the street. There's a place of ministry here in the church. There's a place of ministry over in every corner of the world. But the source of ministry begins at home. It begins at home. God has called us to minister to our families. Now, unfortunately, some people think they need to rule their families. And they feel that, you know what, my word is law. And this, that, and the other. Whether it's a man or woman who has this attitude, let me change your thinking in this. You serve one master. Right. You serve one Lord. You want to know who's in charge of your household if you're a Christian? It's Jesus Christ. Amen. If you are not operating your household on the principles of Jesus Christ, then nobody's in charge. Right. Oh, mm. Mm. So you must mm. leave the family, not rule it. 
Must Amen. <laughs> Amen. So we've got to understand that ministry begins at home. Right. Ministry begins at home. It's not an option. You know, like I said, I want, I want us to understand that this whole spectator, spectator Adventism, spectator Christianity, I can just go to church watching and when I go home, the whole week is mine. I, I'm counting down the minutes until the sun sets. Oh, I'm just, whew, whew, five more minutes. Oh, Lord. Oh, five more minutes. Five, or, or reverse on Friday night. Ooh, I gotta hurry up. I gotta hurry up. I only got five more minutes. This TV show, but this, oh, I'm sorry for that. So you have to spare if you watch TV. So, you've got to get to the point where the presence of God not only envelops yourself, but envelops your entire house, your entire home. And the ministry that you do first starts with your family. It first starts with your family. Thursday. Protecting the sacred. By the way, how much time do I have? Five more minutes? All right. All right. We're going to... You can go over that time. I think we're doing pretty good here. Five more minutes. You can go over that time. I ain't got to go. Come take time. Protecting the sacred. Protecting the sacred. Reverencing the Lord. Reverencing the Lord. Now, I'm going to say this. And I want you to hear it. And don't get mad about it. No. In 2000 on, there is a deep lack of reverence for the Lord in several houses of God. Mm. Right. Mm. Right. 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 There is a deep lack of reverence yes. in the house of God. Yes. Mercy. You know, when I was a kid growing up, there couldn't be side conversations going on. Right. 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 When I was growing up, you couldn't just kick your feet up, lean back, and go to sleep. You, 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 you couldn't do as many things as are going on today in so many sanctuaries. You couldn't have people going out of order in service if we had a protocol that we were following and someone would just jump up and start speaking, an elder or a deacon would sit them down. There you go. I want to talk about that. There also used to be a thing of reverencing God where we loved one another. But how many times do we go to church? How many times do we get disrespected by somebody in the house of God every year? There you go. Uh, are you following me now? Yes. Because if we don't know how to love each other, how can we love the Father? If we can't love our brother who we have seen, yes. how can we love who? God or who we have not seen? Haven't seen. Yes. Reverence in the house of God. Reverence for one another. You know what? Our reverence for God should be at a place where when I see you and I see you, I see the very image of God. Amen. And that alone should give me Amen. cause to have reverence for God. Amen. If we would only understand that we are all fearfully and wonderfully made. If we would only understand that God has given us all things in Christ, then maybe we would have a little more reverence in the house of God. You know, I used to think that when I was a kid that, you know, God had to be defended. And if somebody in the world was talking bad about God, I was ready to punch you in the nose. Because you couldn't talk about my Jesus that way. But how many know that God's Reverence will take care of itself. Yes. You see, when people see you responding in love, let me tell you a story that happened to me. I was coming out of my church, and a man came up to me, and he said, Brother, I want to talk to you. And he began talking, and you know, and he, he began telling me about Jehovah and Jehovah Witnesses and this, that, and the other. And he was expecting me to take him and just toss him or be rude to him or all these different kinds of things. But I didn't. I mean, I wanted to. Now, understand, he got on my nerves. He got on my nerves, twisting up the Bible and saying crazy things. He got on my nerves. But instead, the Holy Spirit said, invite him to church. I want to invite him to church. Lord, he can't mess up the church. Invite him to church. I invited him to church. He came out. You know, that Sabbath afternoon, we had a little potluck supper, and we were eating, and he wanted to try to just, just try to try to bring aggravation to everybody, trying to question everybody, and, and try to bring these false teachings. I said, brother, you can ask whatever questions you want to ask, but right now, we're having time of fellowship. That's right. This is a time when we are enjoying each other's company and reverencing the Lord. And he said, you know what? I've never been invited to a Christian church. 
I've never been invited to eat with other Christians. I had no idea what you were like. In fact, I thought you guys were crazy and just worshiping the devil. But now that I've come in, I see something different. And I would encourage you, come on out. Come on out. Come on out. And he began to come out for a while. And I don't know what happened to the man because he stopped coming out. Maybe that was my breakthrough. Maybe he left me alone because I was quite nice to him. But let me let you know, though, that God's reverence can be seen in your attitude. Amen. God's reverence can be seen in your love. Amen. There are many things you can fake as a Christian, but you cannot fake love. How many know that you can go to church every Sabbath, hold lots of offices, and still not make it into the kingdom? Amen. That's How many right. know that you can That's have a right. form of godliness, but deny the power? Yes. Have no power on the inside. You can eat. You know what? Let me tell you now. If you really had Jesus on the inside, you would have some reverence for your brothers and sisters and the house of God on the outside. So I want to talk about that one more time before you kick me out. Reverence the Lord. It's important. You know, there was a time that God didn't put up with foolishness in this church. There was a time that God didn't put up with foolishness. Here's an example. In the book of Acts, you had two people, they lied to Peter by selling their, selling their own property, where they actually gave all to the Lord, and they dropped dead. Yeah. They dropped dead. Thank God that God is not, well, come on now. Thank God, I probably wouldn't be here right now. But, you know, but let's get real about that. God, if he could, in the New Testament, take a hand of vengeance against those that disrespected the house of God, how much more judgment do you think we will face one day if we don't take seriously the house of God? Do you hear what I'm saying here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's reverence for one another. Amen. Let's reverence the house of God. And most of all, let's love one another. Amen. Amen. May the Lord bless you all. And we keep reading the book of Numbers. God has more in store for you in our Christian growth and development. Amen. 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 Amen.